Welcome. I am Christine Gleason. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I understand some people are still wrapping up lunch. Um, so welcome. Um, if you haven't already scanned the um, QR code on your screen, and um, since we only have 25 minutes today, feel free to finish the QR code after the presentation is concluded, because we don't have a lot of time to cover all of the topic. So today we're going to be talking about reducing barriers to um, success, particularly in the field of inclusion. So we've heard a lot of talk today about um, all the different open educational resources that are available. Um, but one thing to think about as educators is how are we meeting the needs of students with special needs? So like, for example, how are we meeting the needs of a student who is visually impaired, who is colorblind, who is overstimulated easily, who has attention deficit disorder? Um, what are we, what modifications are we providing to make sure that all students have equal opportunity with the open educational resources available to them? So on the agenda today, we're going to talk about what is inclusion exactly, what's the history of inclusion, um, some data that's driving the practices of inclusion right now, and what those results are showing, and then how we can best use those practices moving forward. Um, I like this cartoon because it says that if you measure a fish by how well it can climb a tree, then it will spend its whole life not realizing its potential. In other words, students with, um, if students with open educational resources are not provided using the modifications that they need to access the same material as everyone else, like for example, if a student is blind and we only post a picture of something um, on our open educational resource, we need to make sure to provide the modification of providing a link that will read the description of the picture to the student. So looking at the history of inclusion, we can go back to the 1920s when adults um, were segregated based on their race. Um, in the 1954 ruling of Brown versus the Board of Education, they determined that separate was not equal, um, that separate was inherently unequal. So we need, so then we move to a model where students were not just attending schools um, or facilities away from their home, but they were being included in their home campus, but in separate classrooms. After that, we, um, after that, we um, started seeing students being included in the same classroom as other students. And we're gonna look at some graphs in just a little bit that shows exactly how much that is increasing. So looking at Vygotsky's social constructionism theory, we can see that um, learning is based on the working out a reality um, perspective by through social interaction. So the cartoon on the left shows a person who says there's four blocks here, the person on the right saying no three. So learning to see things from different people's perspectives um, really helps to facilitate inclusion and to help every learner to grow and reach their potential, according to Vygotsky's theory. So how is inclusive education defined? Um, all students are full and accepted members of their school community in which their education setting is the same as their non-disabled peers. So again, with those open educational resources, are we providing the modifications that are needed in order for all students to have the same opportunity as their non-disabled peers? It's a lot of work. It can be a lot of work um, to make sure like the color contrast is high enough, that there's captions on every picture, um, that there's text to speech being offered. Um, but all of those things are really important in making sure we're meeting the needs of all students. So I just want you to take a second and think about um, what exactly is happening in this graph. So this is a graph of students who are being included at least 80% of the time or more. Um, and I just want you to look at like the different disability categories. So um, in the students that are being included the least amount, 80% of the time or more, are multiple disabilities, intellectual disabilities, deaf blindness, autism, emotionally disturbed, traumatic brain injury. Students who are being included 80% of the time or more um, are 
that are more prevalent are like visual impairment, learning disability, speech and language impairment. And I'll check the chat. So you'll notice that a lot of this is based off of behavior and there's autism is actually on the rise um, very predominantly for how many students are being um, included with autism. It used to just be based on academics and now it's being based on social emotional ability and not just intelligence quotients. So students who, you know, 30 years ago would have been in a separate classroom are now being included in the general education setting. So how are we um, as educators, what are we doing to make sure those students are successful and have every opportunity as their non-disabled peers? So the red graph is, um, I'm sorry, the black graph is um, 1989 and the red graph is 2017. So this shows that more and more students are being included in the general education setting 80% of the time or more. So this is 1989, 2017. So there was more students being integrated into their general, into their homeschool setting. And now there's more students being included in their, in the mainstream classroom. So hypothetically, that should mean that we see scores where non-disabled students score the same academically as students without disabilities, but we're actually not seeing um, a huge difference in the scores between students who are not disabled and students who have disabilities. Um, so that tells us from an academic standpoint only, not looking at social emotional and the benefits that it gives, um, you know, non-disabled peers, but just looking at the academics, we're not seeing, um, you know, all of these lines we would want to see be the same, that all students, whether they have a disability or don't have a disability are increasing. So what academically could we do to make sure that inclusion reaches its effectiveness so that students with disabilities are performing the same as their peers without disabilities? So I spent a lot of years, um, 15 years ago, I started studying um, different uh, measurements from around the world. I wanted it to include pre-service teachers and veteran teachers because what we're finding a lot of the data is showing that teachers are um, changing careers after an average of seven years. And one of those founding components was um, attitudes toward inclusion. So what we found after revising the scale, piloting it, writing test questions, checking for reliability and validity, is that some students, um, pre-service teachers, before they start teaching, they have an attitude of, yes, I want everyone to be included. I believe every student should be in the classroom. Um, I can't wait to have everyone in my classroom. And then we're finding with five or more years of experience that their scores are decreasing statistically significantly to where teachers are feeling like they have to pass students, that the students learn that they don't have to work as hard as their non-disabled peers. Um, I through the ethnographic research, I heard things like the student knows they're going to get passed anyways, um, so my hands are tied, just that learned hopelessness. So really digging into those barriers of what is causing teachers' attitudes to decrease um, with experience. And what we found is that there was three um, variables, um, professional development, administrative support, and um, um, exposure to students with special needs. So if those three variables were in place, the teachers were more likely to have a positive attitude toward including children with special needs. Um, through the ethnographic research and the qualitative component of the study, like through the group interviews and the individual interviews, um, we found two underlying variables of locus of control, um, like having to do with self-efficacy and disruptiveness of a behavior. So if a student, if a teacher felt like a student's behavior was highly disruptive to the rest of the class, they were less likely to want to include that student in their classroom. So what can we do to help teachers um, want to include students with special needs? What are the next steps moving forward to make sure that we have an effective model for inclusion? So here's the cycle of inclusion. Um, 
We have the implementation of inclusion, teachers' attitudes, contributing components, impact of components, and success of inclusion. Teachers' attitudes were um, consistently found to be the most influential in this cycle of the effectiveness of inclusion. So how can we use um, different co-teaching models like Ferguson 7Cs, the Castle model, the growth mindset, and co-teaching to really increase the effectiveness of inclusion? So we'll take a look at those. I'll give you a second to read this and I'm gonna check the chat. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauderbeck. So this is one of the models that teachers can use to, um, to increase the effectiveness of inclusion. I included resources at the end if you want to learn more about that. Another model is the CASEL model. Um, it talks about self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, responsible decision-making. Um, it comes from the more eclectic view of the academic, social, emotional learning component of co-teaching. The growth mindset is, you know, do I believe as an educator that I can reach the student? So if I notice that a student is struggling in my class, do I view that as, okay, I can't do anything to help that student? Or do I take the growth mindset of, there's, I know this student can learn. I know the student has what they need to be successful. It's just my job to figure out what exactly I can provide or how I can modify um, how instruction is being presented to the student to make sure that they're successful. Um, deciding where all of the responsibility lies. So figuring out like, whose job is it, if there is a co-teacher, um, whose job is it to provide the accommodations? Whose job is it to provide the modifications? Whose job is it to collect the data? Whose job is it when a student is disruptive um, to the rest of the class? Does one person step out? Do they, is an administrator called? Um, just figuring out all of those um, key components. And a lot of times, you know, we don't have power over it, you know, like sometimes from my personal experience, a teacher um, was not welcoming of having a co-teacher. I've been the special education teacher and the general education teacher. And um, the teacher viewed the students with special needs as totally separate. They um, were not part of her responsibility. She didn't feel like at the beginning. So that pretty much made up the decision for which model we were going to be using. Um, and all I could do was just figure out how to best integrate myself, how to best serve in there wherever I wasn't stepping on toes. Um, and of course, meeting all of the needs of the students with special needs. So there's lots of factors that go into that. And then when do you have time to plan? How can you plan? Like if you want to co-teach or you want to parallel teach or you want to do stations, like, does your administration provide a time for you to meet with um, your co-teacher? Does it provide a time for you to plan instruction? What does that look like? If they don't provide time, how can you, can you do an ongoing document to still collaborate outside of class? You know, what works for both of you? Um, again, just going back to the op open educational resources, um, you know, if those resources need to be modified or additional re resources need to be found for students with special needs, whose responsibility is it to incorporate those additional resources? Um, whose responsibility is it to grade and analyze the data? Um, you know, if there's IEP goals that have to be met. Whose responsibility is it to fill out all of those forms? So we are getting more and more toward, um, you know, an inclusive model where we need to meet the needs of all students in the same environment. 
So just making sure that we're maximizing our resources and utilizing the open educational resources to the maximum extent possible. I heard a lot of people in this morning's talk um, mention how a lot of students can't afford textbooks. Um, that's also my experience. So if we are using those open educational resources, are we using you know quality um, matters to make sure those open educational resources are accessible to all students? So here's just some factors that influence um, inclusion, making sure the students in the least restrictive environment, that they're being accepted, that we're um, being flexible in our education, we're understanding patient, providing visual supports, um, really teaching to the student, like if a student is interested in, you know, um, cars, you know, or racing, like making lessons about cars while keeping, you know, the same Oklahoma academic standard, um, just to increase motivation, um, but still letting that student be autonomous and, you know, providing instruction based on them, um, accommodating students, modifying assignments, um, providing meaningful learning opportunities, letting them work with peers. There's a lot of research about how compassion is built for students who are non-disabled when they have a student with a disability in their classroom. Um, like if a student has um, is on the autism spectrum or if they have um, Tourette's or something that they can't control, a lot of students um, increase their compassion towards a student with a disability after being in the same environment with the student with a disability and even taking up for the student um, when presented with, you know, with peers who were not familiar with the student and their disability. Are we providing routine and structure, you know, whether it's a pre-K through 12 class or a college level class, you know, do we have accommodations and modifications in our syllabus? Like, for example, when I'm teaching mathematics and I use a color-coded chart to help students um, break down all the information and find the patterns between prime numbers and multiplicatives. I have to provide a chart that's in black and white with patterns for the students who are visually impaired or who are colorblind. Um, just making sure that we're meeting all of those needs of students and that we're aware. A lot of times um, students in college um, are not as likely to go to student affairs and you know, request special accommodations. So making sure they you know, are comfortable with that process. Um, I think we're a little bit short on time. So this is a video. Um, I sent the PowerPoint um, to the presentation that you can watch later, but it's just um, how is the teacher making um, making accommodations and modifications to meet the students um, with disabilities in her classroom? Um, and what's one way you saw that? Um, teach me, don't label me. So it says, teach me, don't label me. I am not disabled. I learn differently. I'm not handicapped. I take in and use information that is somewhat unique to me. Others may see me as handicapped when they insist on teaching me in ways through which I cannot learn, or they insist that I demonstrate my abilities in ways that are comfortable for them, but not for me. It is not I who is out of step, inadequate, handicapped, or disabled. It is the system. I don't want my teacher to be my pal, but I do want a model and a friend. I don't want my teacher to make life easy for me, but I do want a teacher filled with the conviction that what he or she teaches is important enough for me to learn. And I do want a teacher who has enthusiasm that encourages me to keep working until I learn. I don't want to be the teacher's pet, but I do want to be treated as a person worthy of respect in spite of learning my learning style or because of it. I don't want a teacher who demands praise, but I do want a teacher who understands my respect, even if I show it is an awkward and sometimes hostile way. I don't want a brain transplant, but I do want to learn as much as I am able. I don't want a label, but I do want an appropriate education. I don't want to be called learning disabled, but I do want to learn. Teach me. And then lastly, I ask you, why do our attitudes towards why do our attitudes towards um, inclusion matter? And I'll finish that with Teddy's story. There's a story many years ago of an elementary teacher. Her name was Mrs. Thompson. 
As she stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, she told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same, but that was impossible because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy. Mrs. Thompson watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with the other children and that his clothes were messy and that he constantly needed a bath. And Mrs. Thompson could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his paper with a broad red pen, marking bold X's and putting a big F at the top of his paper. At the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's past records. She put Teddy's off until last. However, when she reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He is a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy is an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he is troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death must have been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest in his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She felt even worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper, except for Teddy. His present was clumsily wrapped in the heavy brown paper bag he'd gotten from a grocery store. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the students started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was one quarter full of perfume. She stifled the children's laughter when she explained, exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, putting it on and dabbing some of the perfume on her wrist. Teddy stayed after school that day just long enough to tell Mrs. Thompson, today you smelled just like my mom used to. After the children left, she cried for at least an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, and writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy as she worked with him. His mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class, and despite her lie that she would love all the children the same, Teddy became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy, telling her that she was still the best teacher he had in, her, in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. Then he wrote that he had finished high school, second in his class, and that she was still the best teacher he had in his whole life. Four years went by after that. She got another letter saying that while things had been tough at times, he'd stayed in school, had stuck with it, and would soon graduate from college with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he had in his whole life. Then four more years passed and yet another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little farther. The letter explained that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had, but now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. The story doesn't end there. You see, there was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple of years ago, and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit in the place at the wedding that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course, Mrs. Thompson did, and guess what? She wore that bracelet, the one with several rhinestones missing, and she made sure that she was wearing the perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Teddy whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back. She said, Teddy, you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Thank you all so much. Um, and the chat is open for questions. I would be happy to answer. <laughs> You're so welcome. 
and there's resources if you want to know more information or know more about the different co-teaching models and the effectiveness. Um, we have about 30 seconds left, but I sure appreciate you all coming and I hope you found something that was helpful to you and that you can take back to your classroom and use to help your students or just to feel motivated and know that being out in the grounds, you really are making the most difference. And thank you so much for your service and what you do every day to help our future. Thank you, Dr. Gleason. You have a couple of thank yous in the chat, but no questions other than that. And there are no questions in the room here at Rhodes State. Thank you. Thank you so much. And feel free to pass out content later. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauterbach. <laughs> it's my pleasure. We're to see you all in the next session. Thank you, Dr. Gleason. Take care. Okay.